science really um, backs up the notion that being gay or being lesbian, or being straight for that matter, is really a kind of central part of your nature. Well, let me tell you a little bit about the study. This was done actually now over 20 years ago. It was published in 1991. And uh, it was an autopsy study. So I was taking brain tissue from men and women who had died. Some of them had died of AIDS. Some of them had died of other diseases. And I was looking at the hypothalamus, a region of the brain that has a lot to do with our sex lives. And the, it, it had been reported previously by scientists at UCLA that there was a region in the hypothalamus, a small group of cells, that's typically larger in men than it is in women. And what I wanted to see was whether this structure, which has the name INAH3, uh, differs also in size between individuals of the same sex, but of different sexual orientation. And I was able to show that, in fact, it is, It's uh, at least with regard to men. So in heterosexual men, this structure is larger than it is in gay men, at least in my study. There were many objections people had brought to my study after it was published. For example, there was a lot of concern that this uh, difference that I saw was not due to the men's sexual orientation, but perhaps was due, due to the diseases that they had died of, because all the gay men in my study had died of AIDS, but only about half of the heterosexual men have died of complications of AIDS. Um, I'm very confident that this was not the reason for the difference that I saw, and uh, uh, as an example of the reasons why I believe that, uh, when I looked at the heterosexual men who died of AIDS, there was no difference in the size of this structure as compared with the heterosexual men who died of other causes. So there was no indication that just the fact of having AIDS had any effect on the size of this structure. Now, uh, that public study was published in 1991. Since then, there's been one other study, a follow-up study, by a group at uh, Columbia uh, College of Physicians and Surgeons. And in that study, the researchers found also that this structure, INAH3, uh, is smaller in gay men than in straight men. The difference wasn't as great as, um, as I found in my study, but it was in the same direction. So I consider that, consider that uh, if you like, a confirmation of my results. And also, just to mention one other study that's kind of relevant, is that um, more recently, uh, a group in, uh, at Oregon Health Sciences University, led by Charles Roselli, found a very similar result in sheep. And it, it might surprise you to know that um, uh, you can find sheep who, who are essentially gay, uh, male sheep that prefer to have sex or will only have sex with same-sex partners. But uh, that's in fact the case. And what uh, Roselli and his group found was that, again, those male sheep who were sexually attracted to partners of the same sex had a smaller structure in this part of the hypothalamus than did um, uh, the sheep who were essentially heterosexual. So I think those are two, if you like, um, follow-up studies that really uh, confirm uh, my original finding and say yes, there is some basic difference in the brain uh, between uh, individuals who are gay and those who are straight. Generally, these studies uh, point to the, to the idea that uh, what's going on differently between gay and straight people is something in the brain when it's first assembling itself before birth. Now, in other words, there are processes uh, when the hypothalamus and other parts of the brain are being created, when the nerve cells are being born and, and starting to develop and form connections before birth, that goes forward differently in fetuses that ultimately become gay adults and those become straight adults. And the difference seems to be brought about, at least in part, by sex hormones that are circulating in the blood of the fetus. These hormones come from the 
from the, uh, the, the, the gonads, from the uh, testes or ovaries of the fetus, they enter the brain and they influence how the brain develops in a, in a sexual sense, whether it develops in a more masculine or more feminine direction. And there's a lot of evidence now that um, this process really goes forward differently in, if you like, gay and straight fetuses. These subtle anatomical differences or physiological differences that have been described recently, finger length ratios in um, the physiological properties of the inner ear, uh, fingerprint patterns and so forth, they um, all seem to fit into the same basic picture, which is to say they seem to be caused or result from differences in the way that sex hormones are interacting with the brain and the body during early life. So high levels of testosterone seem to drive the brain and the body in a male typical direction. Low levels allow the brain and the body to develop in a more sort of female typical direction. And it's that sort of general process, if you like, that causes there to be some kind of link between these anatomical features like finger length ratios and a person's sexual orientation. It's as if it's part of a big package of traits, all of which have some common developmental process behind them. There are experimental studies on animals. What's been done in many species now is you manipulate the hormone levels that a, a a developing animal is exposed to. So you might add testosterone to a female fetus of a rat or some other species, or you might take away testosterone from a male by castrating it early in development. And uh, what's found in those cases is, that when, is when the animal grows up, it shows atypical sexual behavior. It may um, actually uh, associate sexually more with same-sex partners than with opposite-sex partners, for example. So that's one um, line of evidence that suggests that you know, if something comparable is going on in humans, it might have to do with differences in early sex hormone levels. The evidence that genes play a role comes from comparing the, the similarity in sexual orientation between monozygotic or so-called identical twins and dizygotic or so-called fraternal twins. And these identical twins share pretty much 100% of the same genes, whereas the fraternal twins are just like regular brothers or sisters. They share about half their genes. And to the extent that a trait like sexual orientation is genetically influenced, uh, you should see a higher agreement in sexual orientation between those pairs of twins who are identical compared with those who are fraternal. And that's what you find. So it's certainly not the case that every pair of identical twins share the same sexual orientation, but they do so much at a much higher rate than those twins who are fraternal. And if you, go, you can sort of go through the arithmetic uh, from those numbers and derive a measure of what proportion of the total causation of a person's sexual orientation is genetic. The birth order effect, this finding that a, a man who has an older brother is slightly more likely to be gay than a man who doesn't have any older brothers, is a, an unexpected finding that uh, came out in the last uh, 10 years or so as a result of the, uh, the research of these Canadian uh, groups. Now, no one knows exactly what is the reason for this birth order effect, but uh, the supposition is that it's due to some interaction between uh, a developing fetus and its mother, such that if a mother has already carried one male fetus, then when she has a subsequent male fetus in her womb, there's some memory of that early, earlier pregnancy which interacts with the developing second or later male child in such a way as to influence that child uh, to be more likely to be gay when he grows up. Now, the exact mechanism for that isn't known, but that's the supposition. I should say that the birth order effect is a pretty weak effect. You'd actually have to have about 10 older brothers before you'd have even a 50-50 chance of being gay by the birth order effect alone. But it does seem to be real, and it's an intriguing finding that really needs to be explored.